My name is Brian Alcesser. I'm with Eric Hall. This is State of Sales West. We're super excited to, to have you all here. I, I, 136 of you sharing your time at the end of a day, which is friggin' awesome. Investing in yourselves, investing in your business, and we're super excited to have you. Let's get this quick introductions. How about a brief? If you can do your your hey, how did I get into sales, and what do I do now in a minute? Uh, KD, when you start talking. What up, y'all? KD, Kevin Dorsey, VP of Inside Sales at Patient Pop. I got into sales in college because I knew there'd always be a sales job. Even if I sucked, I could always find a job selling. And so I started off knocking doors, selling cut up, like knockoff Cutco knives, which led to many of a police encounter. And here I am now, student of the game, love sales, love salespeople. Uh, my value tonight. That's it. Nice. Awesome. Uh, hey, all, oh, I forgot to mention, by the way, if you have questions, make sure to pop them up into the event tab. We have people there to to, to get them over to us and we can make sure we're asking them. Okay. Should I click on the events tab? I feel like I'm not seeing everything. Click the event tab, but don't click anything else. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> guilty, right. guilty. Ashley, how about you go next? <laughs> Uh, so I'm Ashley. I uh, am the head of sales development at Brex. Uh, started my career a handful of years ago. We won't num name the number, but uh, started in outside sales for a, a IT staffing company. So absolutely loved, fell in love with sales, loved the people aspect of it, loved the mentorship aspect of it. Always wanted to get into tech sales. So um, when I was leaving that company, there was a uh, SaaS company in San Francisco called Zenefits that was kicking off. And, um, you know, we, we can go into those details way later if anyone has questions. But uh, started actually as an SDR there and was one of the first helped build out the organization. From there, um, moved on to a couple other tech companies, including uh, Lever, um, built out, you know, any org from the size of 200 to 50, huge on career development and promotion paths. And so that's my favorite thing to talk about. Um, and just started Brex about a year ago um, in March and have hired about 30 uh, or so SDRs that have moved into their career since then. Um, I'm Michael Tuso, I'm the Director of Revenue Performance here um, at Chili Piper. Um, I actually started off my career um, as fundraising for a political campaign. I was a campaign manager for a statewide political campaign. Uh, was really interested in the fundraising aspect of that. A uh, friend said, uh, hey, we are recruiting people to do this sort of work abroad program. So I traveled around South America for two years. Um, and, and so that's really how I entered corporate tech sales, doing the exact same thing that you would be in an SDR role, um, but I just did it from abroad. And then when I came back, I worked for uh, Citrix, um, as a, an account executive and manager there um, before also uh, moving out to California, working for a couple of startups in uh, Los Angeles um, with Kevin Dorsey right here. Uh, we work together at Snack Nation um, and now um, leading the revenue teams to SDR account management and account executives here at Chili Piper. Um, when I started, we uh, had two AEs on the team. Now we have an entire SDR team, an entire account management team, and a much larger account executive team um, who are all thriving and doing really well. Boom. All right, now I'm Brian Alcesser. I'm the Senior Director of Sales Development at Aircall. I work with the other guy that has the Aircall shirt on. Uh, I am uh, I got into sales actually as being the, the number one Candy salesman in uh, Boy Scouts back when I was 12 years old, and I never stopped selling since. Uh, I uh, I've been. Uh, it was funny. I, I got. I went through a little stage where I was a, a singer for a while, and then after I was done being a singer, and I ran out of money, like most American opera singers do, I decided I needed to go sell stuff, and I wound up selling Yellow Pages advertising. The rest is history. I've been been selling ever since. Made a great career of it so far. Loving every minute of it. Um, so cool. Awesome. Welcome panel. Uh, a bunch of people are saying they don't believe that you sing opera. Can you prove it? Yeah, go to YouTube. It's it's live 24 <laughs> seven. I 24 seven on YouTube. In fact, I never stop singing on YouTube. That's the wonderful power of that tool. Um, all right, so panel, just how how we'll run this tonight. I don't. I will probably call out individuals for specific questions, but it's an all player game. So like, if you have a 
quit and go and do it. I want to start with a question around, there's a lot of change happening right now. I think that's the biggest understatement ever said. We had a lot of industries that have been directly affected from the economy, from the fallout of COVID. And I'm curious, like, there's been a lot of talk right now, right? Like LinkedIn's blowing up a lot of different ideas, but what is the stuff that hasn't been talked about? Like what's top of your mind that's going, man, no one's talking about this and like we really need to talk about it. Let's start off. I'll rock, let's go. Um, what I don't think is getting talked about enough right now is fear. Everyone's talking about empathy. Everyone's talking about like normal, old normal, everything else. What I don't think is being talked about enough right now is fear and what that causes people to do. And fear on both sides. Not only are most prospects afraid, but afraid for health, afraid for their business, afraid for their teams, afraid for their company, but also our salespeople are afraid. They're afraid of rejection. They're afraid of missing quota. They're afraid of being let go. And not enough people, I think, are talking about fear and what it does to people. Right. There's three, the three F's. Right. Everyone talks about the two F's of fear. There's actually three F's of fear. There's fight, flight, and freeze. And I think what we're seeing right now is a lot of that third F, which is the freeze. Companies are freezing, reps are freezing, prospects are freezing. And I think a lot more needs to be talked about how we can diffuse that fear, what we can do to make our reps less fearful, but also what we can do to make the prospect less fearful. And if you scale your messaging to bring off the fear, I think that's how we can navigate this time a little bit better. Colin, I know you have something to add there, but before we do that, why don't you introduce yourself? Because I really wanted to make sure you had a platform to do so. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Colin Cadmus, uh, Vice President of Sales at Aircall. And how I got into sales, long story short, been selling random shit my whole life, sold lots of car parts in college, used to go on Craigslist and buy them and then flip them on eBay, uh, all sorts of weird stuff like that. Uh, but I did not start my career in sales. I started my career in retail management because I graduated in 2008, which was a time very similar to today. Uh, it was the worst time to graduate and uh, the job market was scarce. So I took what I could get, got into retail management, did it for four years, hated it. Uh, the market started to turn around. So moved back to New York and uh, got a job cold calling at a company called Single Platform which was kind of the platform that uh, pushed me to uh, launch my sales career. They had a very successful exit. So I was able to take that from being an AE to head of sales training. And then my first VP of sales job at doctor.com, where we competed heavily with uh, patient pop. Um, and then I left there three years later to try to start my own business, failed miserably. And here I am now at Aircall doing what I do best. Rock. Well, so back to uh, KD's um, fight, flight, or freeze with the emphasis on the freeze. I mean, how, how did you react to that? You asking me? Yep. Yeah, I think he's right. I think nobody knows what the hell is happening, right? And because and there was, this isn't like, I don't think this is like 2008 where you kind of see it coming and it gradually started. Right. This just smacked us in the face out of nowhere. And companies went from do, from being a, in the best economy, right, that the world has seen in a long time. Uh, things were, were at its highest. And then it just got pulled away from us really, really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree. We are in the freeze mode. Nobody knows what the hell is going on. Nobody knows what to expect. And they're turning to us as leaders to have answers. And we don't have answers. So we have to be honest with that. Um, and we'll, we'll touch more on that in the, in our leadership, uh, corner, how we'll handle that as leaders. But, uh, but yeah, I agree. Quick. I'd love, I'd love to touch on that real quick too. I think that, I think that now more than ever, this is the moment for people to be going to bat for their teams. And I think like with so much uncertainty right now, and when people feel uncertain, it's easy to feel frozen. It's easy to feel like you don't know what to do. And in those moments, more than ever, your team needs us to double down and in investing in our people and our products and really feeling like we are going back to bat for them. And there's no better opportunity to demonstrate that leadership than when everyone is facing fear and you sort of meet that with op knowing that once we're out of this, if you're doubling down on your products and you're doubling down on your people, and that when we turn this corner, the people that were doing that all along the way are going to be the people that are meeting more opportunity in the future because that's just who they are. So 
I think that's one of the things I'm not seeing people talk enough about that we all should be talking about. That's a fair point too. I um, <clears throat> I, I, I want to circle back to one question here before we go to the next one here on, from one of our, our listeners here, Pierre Brigiera had a quick question for Kevin. So Kevin, you, you specifically mentioned fear. Um, he wants to know if there's an example you can give quickly on how fear is impacting sales reps recently. Oh, a absolutely. Um, so when it really went south, right? Like things were pretty good until the middle of March. Like, you know, we were doing all right. When it went south fast, right? Like we do a lot of cold calling, we do a lot of prospecting and we started getting rejections that were personal. Like there's sales rejection that we all deal with, but like people are like, do you have a soul? Like, can, how are you? Like, am I allowed to swear on this, by the way? If we talk for it, man, it's, yeah. yeah. You're, you're, yeah. Right. All right. I, I, I double check, right? You know, I know I turn it off. It's like, you know, are you fucking kidding me? Like, you son of a, like, I mean, people were ripping my AEs and SDRs apart and like mm -hmm. literal fear. Like, I'm talking handshaking fear of like, how on earth do I pick up this phone and make another phone call when I'm getting that? Right. And so we put a quick pause. I said, okay, hey, give like pause for a second. Let's figure out how we can do this differently because the old way didn't work. But like my reps were afraid mm -hmm. as well it should have been because it turned fast. There's rejection, but then there we could tell we were having a negative impact on not only people, but our brand. And so we put a quick pause of like, let's see how we can do this differently. So that, that's a story on um, Pierre. Like, it got real fast and we pulled back for a second reorged and then moved forward michael i think that goes back to your point too on the enablement piece right like making sure that you're equipping and i think it's also about equipping with the right messaging because it seems like the messaging's changing so fast right now like we have to really keep up ashley i'm sure you're seeing that on your end with your team how quickly messaging needs to change in order to keep that relevant yeah, we've done we've done a lot of pivoting of messaging. We've done a lot of pivoting of restructuring of where our teams are supporting the org. Like all of that has has shifted quite a bit. When I think of what Katie is talking about, as far as like the fear factor and how do you transition that into confidence, um, I've actually been really impressed with my team on how they've been able to find that confidence. And so we've what all of us have probably gone blue in the face talking about diversifying touch points with calls, emails, LinkedIn, like all the stuff that we've all been talking about forever. And I feel finally like this is the time where even my my own reps are starting to actually adopt to that, where be, they're seeing like, this is the time. If there isn't another time to start testing these different models and then, you know, pivoting as you go, like when is there a better time to do that? And so I feel like this is the first time in a while I have felt my reps really mature in their sales ability and it comes down to me pushing them on those those types of areas as well that's a really solid point <clears throat> that's a so I'm, I'm curious right so there's a there's a few things happening and, and i think the topics that are that are flying around are kind of all over the board because there's so much change happening at once you know remote work has been kind of a trend that's been that's been one of those things that's been thrown around it's obviously taken hold it seems teams across the country have risen to that challenge of transition for the most part. I, I, it's hard for me to hear one. I don't know of one really that hasn't. Um, so like, what's like, how has there been an element of trust, I guess is what I'm, I'm getting at. It seems like there's an element of trust that's been lacking from the leadership side. And, and I'll explain just quickly, right? We've, I think, are notorious as sales leaders to be like, no, no, we trust our teams, we enable our teams, we want our teams to go to bat. But then we had this moment of transition. We're like, oh no, what are they gonna do? Is it gonna work out? And we had that scary moment, right? So I guess I'm curious, like, how do you see trust changing? How do you see that changing the perception of how leaderships are going to market with their teams? Yeah, we've been working remotely. Um, at Chili Piper, we're, we're entirely distributed. We have uh, about 30 different cities, almost 20 different countries. Um, and I had the same sort of anxiety about uh, two and a half years ago when I started at Chili Piper. I had this inclination of like wanting to walk over to the desk and like fix something there. And so finally, about six months later, the CEO asked me to like move to a different WeWork from uh, the SDR that I was working with specifically in the actual office. And it really taught me a lot about how to work remotely. And since then, I've really evolved my thinking about uh, remote work in general. And it really has upped my game as a sales leader with being more precise on things that I need 
um, fostering a diffused leadership structure and more peer-to-peer -peer learning where people are mutually reinforcing like concepts uh, among the team. And it's not just something that sounds good, but the results have like really followed and, and risen um, as a result. And I've really come to adopt the idea that if you can't trust someone to work remotely, then you probably shouldn't have ever hired them to begin with. And that's the level of trust that I seek with my team. And then, in, and then they expect me to deliver as well. And so this remote culture has really enabled us to focus on how do you do things? How do you get better? And not just how many, how many hours of call talk time did you do? Did you do all the things that I asked you right. to do? And it's much more of a diffused uh, leadership uh, dynamic, which honestly has been really awesome to watch the SDRs, AEs, and account managers on our team get so much better as a result. You know, just a just real quick follow up on that, Michael. You you had said there's a couple of things you really like focus into, really see and, and watch the success. Do you have an example of what that looks like for you? Like what you're really looking into for as a as a as a leader. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, in the beginning, you know, when someone's ramping as an account executive, for example, people tend to divert to pitching their product right away instead of like diving into the discovery and uncovering the, this sort of human motivation that will that will result in a closed one yeah. deal. So, fre so frequently, even if we think back to our own experiences and our biases on sales, we tend to jump in and thinking. Uh, uh, I need to pitch this product in order to get the deal. And we still see it on so many calls today, people demoing and saying like, does this make sense all throughout the call and then expecting just the product pitch to close the deal. So one actionable thing for me is like, at the beginning of the call, at the beginning of their ramping and onboarding, really set that expectation of what a good discovery looks like and what it doesn't look like, and really enable them to get better there. And we double, we really double down on that through calls, things like call scoring, uh, all of their calls, then listening to calls repeatedly uh, over the time, a uh, peer-to-peer mentoring program, and then a weekly built-in training program uh, where I'm not the only one leading, but different people in the company as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Ashley, I have a question for you next, but I have one other question here, Kevin and, and, and Colin. It would seem that this kind of environment isn't built for every sales leader. Um, I mean, some leaders are just born to be sales leaders on an inside sales team. That could be perceived. Do you have an opinion on that? It's a good question. I think probably, right? I think we've been lucky, at least uh, at Aircall, that people adapted pretty well. Um, but I can certainly see how it's not for every sales leader. And, and I'm thinking back to my doctor.com days where I was running not only an inside sales team, but an outside sales team, uh, as well as a trade show sales team, which was even different. It was a different beast all and of its own because not only are they, they're not working a local market, right? So you can't even have a manager out there uh, checking up on them, see how many doors they're knocking, do a shadowing session for a couple hours a day. Uh, we actually had to trust them to fly, you know, around the nation yeah. uh, and, and be in hotels and have company credit cards and not party too hard at the end of uh, of each show. And so, uh, yeah, I, and trust me, we hired some wrong people who just could not handle that level of, uh, you know, being in a nice hotel with a co corporate card um, all the time. But but anyhow, to get back to your question. So, yeah, I, I would imagine that there are some sales leaders that are completely struggling right now. Uh, to adapt to this the, the same way that I think there could be SDRs and AEs who will struggle with it. It's not it's not for everyone, but uh, I think we're fortunate that we live in a world where <clears throat> many of us were already set up with the tools to do it, yeah. right? For the most part, because most of our, our work is in the cloud. We're all mostly working off of laptops. Um, you know, and, and those who weren't set up for it, I mean, that's why we've seen an influx of business at Aircall because they, they come to us, right? But the the truth is they can find those tools pretty quickly and get set up within probably a week or so. They're, you know, they're, they're able to function remote. Um, to go back real quick to your point about trust, <clears throat> I was nervous about uh, will they be productive, but I got over that really, really quickly when I realized that in order for them to be productive, I need to make sure that they have what they need. And, and then my mind quickly shifted to, holy shit, this isn't about, can I trust them? This is about, I need to prove they can trust me to help make sure that they have what they need, right? And yeah. we made the, the first week, it was all about getting your home workstation set up, 
right? We did the we did a photo contest. Everyone had to post pictures of their home workstation. You know, if they needed Ethernet cords or whatever, we're ordering parts and getting monitors for people. And um, I, I think that was the bigger piece was making sure they have the tools to do what they need to do, because then we can just hold them accountable, and it's on them. And that's where, at least at Aircall, our, our team really rose to the occasion. And I think, if anything, they're working harder because they know it's 100% on them I, uh, to do that. I think that's a huge point, Colin, is that like we have to realize like the whole, I don't know, I used to think of work from home as like kind of the like work from home thing. And like the joke yeah. is now on us is that we're all work from home. And so how do we figure out like a way of making this like yeah. actually possible and successful? Yeah. And I think it started with the fundamentals from day one. And so the second we found out that we were, were in San Francisco, my company, which was one of the first, you know, counties and areas that was like, you're, you're, you're leaving and you're going to be remote from here on uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, but I know myself, if I were, and I was a 23 year old SDR at one point, I knew what I would be doing if I had time off and was able to do what I wanted to do. So how do you empower people, hold them accountable, give them the tools that they need to be successful. And so um, it was one of the biggest like opportunities for us in the beginning was we are, we started with doing like daily standups twice a day in the morning, end of day. And while I hate to ever be that micromanaging leader, we made it fun to your point, like send me what your best um, background of what your work from home view looks like. What like lunch did you make today? Share a back best practice. And then we have this like little wheel of SDR fortune and like clicks one person and each person gets to ask 20 quite like one question for each person a yes and no, whatever, like something to get to know your people again. Right. Like I think all of us are missing that interaction mm -hmm. so much and there's, definitely ways that we could like accomplish that even in this remote environment. But I think that is um, like how you start at the very foundational level of how do you start to run your teams in this new world that we I think have. It's probably one of the places, point. I think that's one of the, probably the places we're going to see breakout in the next couple of years of good businesses that are going to help remote teams get better accustomed to working with each other even more than what they're doing today. A quick call out here, Blake Matuska and Israel Neeson, um, make sure you join the uh, the SDR breakout. Those questions are really good for that breakout. Ashley, I want to go to you for a second. So, uh, you know, I think what's interesting, at least from my end at Aircall, what we're seeing between Colin, myself, and, my, and our team, we're seeing the ICP change based upon, in some ways, based upon what's happening, right? Like non-traditional customers becoming customers. I'm curious to get your take from Brex on, on exactly if seeing similar interesting trends of new ICPs that have like, you know, brought themselves forward. And, and what does that look like? How has your team gone about tackling it? That's a great question. So I think um, one of the things I'm most proud of our team, Rex, like from a business standpoint, which I think of like, obviously the macro level compared to like what we're focusing in on is um, wh who are the customers that we can actually acquire that are best for a long-term ROI. And I think um, all of us have read predictable revenue, which we talked about earlier with, with Aaron Ross and like the whole function of an SDR org is predictability. And when you go into a climate like today, all of a sudden you have lost that predictability. And so how can you hone in as much as you can to understand who are the accounts that we're going after? Who are the personas? What are we messaging? And like, what does the funnel actually look like? And what is like, where where can we get the most out of that? And so what we've done a really good job of, so I think so far, uh, is looking at where is, uh, where do we have to pivot? Where do we have to change? And we've had to change. And so I've um, I actually only have 15 SDRs right now, which is one of the smallest SDR teams I've ever had. Um, but seven of them were supporting a vertical um, that is being challenged in the market right now. And we have we support a ton of different verticals, everything from tech, not, tech uh, like tech companies, uh, e-commerce businesses, nonprofits, uh, professional services across the board. And so really honing in on like where where's our sweet spot and where can we make sure that we're eliminating the most risk to the business and getting the most ROI out of that. Yeah. And because us and we know that the SDR function is um, yeah, it's expensive, but it's probably one of the best um, attribution areas within the go-to-market function. And I'm super bullish on that. If we can have a whole nother conversation about how I'm very convinced that it will be the third pillar within the go-to-market function without having to report to marketing or sales. So that's another day. <laughs> I'm sure, Brian, you agree with me. Yeah, yep, but yep, yep. 
<laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, so I think uh, being able to pivot and make sure you know exactly who your ICP is, um, how do you message to them? How do you break out what the accounts are? I think um, looking at the funnel historically has always been the number of accounts worked down to reply rates, down to meeting scheduled, qualified accounts, and um, uh, close one deals. I think there's more opportunity now than ever to hone in on different pinpoints for your business. And so for where we found is looking at um, not the reply rate. We've we've been really successful with like a 20% reply rate, but like from reply to meeting scheduled, look what is needed there. Yeah. Is it coaching? Is it messaging? Is it just a leaky funnel? Like what does that look like? And like how can you really pinpoint? Because I think as a um, as an org in a really lucrative startup business, um, which I'm sure you guys can kind of, you know, relate to, like we've gotten spoiled. We have to get tighter with our business. We have to get tighter in these different areas throughout the funnel and get back to our, back to basics. And like, that's, that's kind of some of the things I want to talk about in our breakup, breakup, <laughs> breakout session is how do we, uh, how do we hone in on those little small areas of opportunity to actually move the needle? Because when you look at them at like a bigger picture, it seems much more overwhelming than if you hone in on small. I love ones. that. No, I think we, we can go really deep on that too. I, I, you said if, if something a minute ago I thought was really interesting and will help us pivot from where we are right now discussing state of sales current to state of sales future. Kevin, I'm going to shoot this one to you and, and I, I think it, this is interesting. You know, pivoting can be can mean messaging, it can mean how you're going to market, but it, it seems like some SaaS companies may have to pivot all together on how they're going to, you know, how they're doing business and what they're what they're presenting to the market. Um, I'm curious on your 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 take on reinvention and and maybe you know pivoting of a business model, um, and and I'm in, in asking so sensitive to the fact of you know I, I know how how you know impacted you know you guys have been over at Patient Pop currently, so I'm curious I'm curious to get some take on that from you. So I mean I think there's two things I'll touch on there. I mean pivots are required. In fact, damn near every super successful startup was something different before they started and they pivoted over time right um and so we've done something very similar but it's knowing the only way you can properly pivot is knowing the problem of your prospects mm -hmm. right a lot of p what is that alliteration <laughs> i don't know <laughs> yeah yeah someone hashtag that shit you can only pivot if you know the problem of your prospects um and so that's what's required. If you don't actually know your prospects well and the problems that they have, you can't pivot with a new product. Oh, God, I'm firing right now. Um, and so that's what we did, right? And so, like, we, what is the problem for our prospects now? It's a new problem. It's a new problem. They can't see their patients. Another one. Jesus. So because our prospects new problems, they can't see their patients. The new product we rolled out was telehealth. Right. We know they have a new problem. And because we know that we can quickly pivot. But if you don't know your prospects problems, you can't pivot. Then you're just rolling out some new shit that you don't need. Right. But that, man, one more P word. This is why process based leadership is so important. Mm. Because the way I coach and Chiso knows this, too, is very fill in the blank. It's process based. Here's how you create a gap. Here's how you ask these questions. Here's how you do discovery. Not here's how you do discovery patient pop. Here's how you do discovery. Because of that process, going remote, not much of an effect. New product, all we did was research better on what the product is, fill in the blanks as we go through. That's how you can do, if you have a process-based sales system, you can pivot quickly. If you have a product-based sales system, you're going to be fucked because once there's a new product, no one knows how to sell it, right? Right. So what did I drop there? Prospect problem, pivot, process, whatever else, patient pop. That's my thoughts on it. I love it. I love it. Um, anything to add by any of the other panelists? I really want to. No, I, I think that's Love just... It. It was it was brilliant to watch how you guys did that, KD. Because like I, you know, I still keep in touch with guys from Doctor.com. We sold a very similar service, and for those who don't know, like the whole service is around helping doctors drive patients into their office, right? And and then you wake up one day and they can't do that, right? <laughs> and then so you got prostate doctors are screaming at you, and and I thought that was interesting too. You got me thinking back into like my old days of of selling to doctors and 
I see why they got so angry because it's it's not just like this is a bad time to buy. They're on the front lines, right? They're seeing the worst of it. So to hit them with that call right there about something they do not need, uh, I could see the backlash would happen fast. It's impressive how, how fast you guys just identified what the new problem was because doctor.com page about we would have never thought about telehealth before it was like the 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 market didn't want it right there were so many people investing in it and it wasn't working and now all of a sudden overnight right the the need changes well we fired up the team around and actually talk about this a little bit firing people up around it It was like that was the point like yo we can sell anything to doctors Mm -hmm. because we understand them so what my team pulled off, we've been selling it for three, barely even three weeks. I mean, that that fast to sell what we're selling right now only happens if they've been taught the right way and there's processing in place, right? That's the only way to do it. And I'm incredibly proud of how they've done with it. And we're still getting better. But like, that was our wrapping yeah. I was like, let's out sell every other telehealth company out because they haven't been taught how to loop. They haven't been taught how to do gap based. They haven't been taught this proper follow. They don't use Vidyard and email and phone call and social. They don't sell the way that we do. And yeah, yeah. rallying cry. And I'm incredibly proud. So, so like, let's just dial it into one last question for this panel quick before we go into the questions of, believe it or not, we've been doing this for four months already, which is amazing. Um, We'll take some questions from the audience. Uh, audience, if you have questions, make sure you put them into the chat. We'll, we'll get them serviced, uh, served up to us. So, so I think my last question for you guys, though, is here is like the economy itself is, is of course, changing, right? It's evolving. It's, it's completely going to reinvent itself here in the next in the next several months, call it 12, 24, whatever you want it to be. And I think like good salespeople, you have to think about where the avenue is that's changing. You have to think about how the economy changes everything, right? People selling the restaurants, how are we going to sell differently? People selling to the transportation industry, how are we going to sell differently? I'm curious to hear though, like next breakout segment that you think will have disruption. And I'm curious on, to, to hear your thoughts on where do we think the next disruption is? Where wants to take a stab at it first? Hmm. I think it fails. I can... I could touch on it maybe a Kevin, bit slightly panels, Kevin. No, I said sales. Oh, because I, <laughs> I thought they thought you said panels for that. I thought uh, sales, go for it. I mean, think of how much sales is already changing in three weeks. Yep. Right. Events may never come back fully. Right. They, they they'll come back a little bit, but to where it was before, I don't know that they come back. Right. So like that's a massive part, right? Field sales, okay? Like, we have a field sales team. I think this was, like, and they're doing well, but, like, this could be a nail in a lot of field orgs, like, that old school fly in, wine and dine. That's a big shift, right? To Ashley's point earlier, the SDR org, right, pipeline. No one is struggling as heavily right now to close as they are to generate pipeline. Mm pipeline is going to be this like this becomes the navy seals type role i think we start to see a shift there where pipeline is more heavily valued because the buyer so notice getting them into the funnel right i think sales is the next disruption that we can guarantee we can't predict we can't predict a COVID. no one woke up in march like you know what i bet there's gonna be a pandemic <laughs> right but what it's doing is it's exposing a lot of the old school flaws the sales industry had. Yeah. And sales is going to be forced to adapt. That That's where I think the disruption that we know is happening. We know sales are being disrupted right now. The other ones I don't think we can predict as well. Katie, I love that. Yeah. That's a good point about field sales. <laughs> Get it, actually. Sorry, really quick. I, I love that, Katie. I think like to my point, like what I was trying to make my point earlier is like, we are being called on our own bluff in sales right now. It's like we've been spoiled up until this point. Like it's time to get like closer to our business. And so the instead of like like it's now a sniper versus rifle mentality across the board. And like how do we actually get closer to every account and get deeper and deeper is what we're going to have to do in this type of uh, world that we're in right now. And for those of us in sales that enjoy that, it's going to be good. And for those of us that haven't honed in on what that 
looks like from partnering with enablement. How do you cross functionally work with your marketing team and your BD team and everything like that? And then take that a step further. How do you actually partner with them in the world that we're in right now? It takes it like two steps further. And those are the companies and teams that are gonna like go to market orgs are gonna be able to like take it to the next level. Just to add to that, I totally agree with both of you. I think that like we're kind of at this moment where like a lot of people, you know, even in our own stories at the beginning of how we entered this, like a lot of times people don't choose sales as their first profession. And I think that in in this world, like you're going to have to be the top of your game. And I think that this, um, you know, this moment more than ever is an opportunity for all of us to up our game. And, you know, like Ashley said, we've been sort of getting away with a lot, but those people that have been, you know, solely relying on canned emails and not, you know, uh, personalizing, making things contact contextual to their prospects, like the people that have been skimping um, all of this time are going to be the ones that will have this sort of uh, awakening. And I think it's going to, you know, I think you know, finally sales will have that, that wake up call as well. So I totally agree with both of you. Bri, one thing I would add in there to, to zoom out and just look at the software industry or, or SaaS, yeah. I think what's what's going to be sort of the longer term effect of this uh, is there's actually an acceleration of adoption for, for technology, right? Because all of the people, and I see this at Aircall, and I bet it's happening at, at Patient Pop, um, you're selling software and there's always a piece of the market that are not the early adopters. They're the hardest ones to sell to, the last people you try to sell to. And those people are all right now getting forced outside of their comfort zones to rely on technology more than they would have, right? And it may have taken them 10 years to get to the point that they're now at today. And so for the companies that figure out how to sell something that's valuable, like like Patient Pop has figured out, those people are, are going to be more open to it, right? And we're seeing it at Aircall. Um, we're seeing different verticals reaching out to us who we would have never tried to go after because getting them off of a hard phone it was an uphill battle. They were just no, 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 no. But now they have to do it. And so now they're coming to us, right? And they're making a shift. They're adopting the technology that they would not have adopted under any other circumstance. So uh, I think in the long run, uh, this is a win for, for SaaS from, from that regard. So I, 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 uh, great point, Colin. So I, I think that's, that's going to wrap up my questions for here. We're going to do one question from the audience. Everybody, I, we've gotten a lot of really awesome questions, but they seem to be really categorized well. So I just want to explain real quick what we're going to do before we go and take this question and we'll do our, our quick networking and expo. So we're, we we have three breakout sessions happening, okay? We have a sales leadership that's going to be with Colin and KD. We have a sales enablement with Michael Tuso. And then we have SDR and prospecting with Ashley and myself. And, and the way this will work is about... 15 minutes from now, um, you'll be able to pop over to sessions on the left-hand browser, and you'll be able to you'll be able to pop in there. Yeah, Michael, you got remote work as well, so if anybody has remote work, you can pop in there. Um, but the question we'll take before we do that, and and in that 15-minute window, guys, everyone, there's a little networking thing again. You can go back to the speed networking. You can go check out Zendesk Cell or AirCall. Um, we have live chat features there if you have questions for either of those people, uh, either of those companies. But we're gonna go to our boy uh, Bilal Batralia. Uh, I, Bilal, I'm so pumped that you got on this call here, man. Good to, good to see your name up here. You got a good question. A lot of sales teams aren't winning like they used to. What should sales culture be pivoting to? What's the healthy sales culture during a revenue downturn? I, I think that's a great question. I think it's good for any of us if, if any want to stop, dive into that. I'll, I'll take a first stab at it. You have to redefine what winning is, right? Uh, if, if winning was hitting the goals that you had set in, in January, um, that's probably not what winning is today, right? For many companies, winning right now uh, is managing your net negative churn, right? And you have to reestablish those targets. You have to give people um, uh, something that they can hit, right? And and winning could just be, for, for many SDR orgs today, winning may not be generating qualified pipe. Winning may be just opening up conversations for the long run. And as a leader, you need to figure out what winning can be for your team um, rather than what you hope or wish that it could be, you have to define that that properly. It's got to be a smart goal, right? Just go back to the basics, smart goal. Uh, and, and if you start there, then celebrate those wins. And, and they, you may not have considered that a win three three weeks ago, four weeks ago, but so that's that's on us. Yeah. I'll jump in there real quick. Well, what up, my boy? I see you out there, by the way. Um, to me, they're different things. If you have to win to have a good culture, you have a shitty culture. It really is that culture and winning are two totally different things. Yep. 
And that's what's important. I've gone through it too, where we were win. too, so will remember this. We were winning and we were winning and we were winning. We had the best culture, best place to work. Everything's good. And all of a sudden we started to miss and our culture got exposed. So to me, the, like all of a sudden, then the nitpicky, then the complaining, then the negativity came. We actually didn't have the culture we thought we did because we were winning. So to me, they're two totally different things. I just went through one of the hardest things I've ever gone through as a leader. And we'll probably talk about this in leadership. And my team culture was still there. We weren't winning, but I cannot speak highly enough of the culture of the people that I have. The behaviors were there. The activity was there. The mindset was there. We've rallied together even stronger and we're not winning right now. So I think that's something that's very important is if your culture is dependent on winning, you don't have the right culture. If you look at any head coach that takes over an org, it's always cliche. But what's the first thing the head coach talks about when they come into an org? Establishing a winning culture. Not getting wins, it's getting a winning culture. And to me, those are separate things. So, Bilal, like to your question here, yeah, we're not winning right now. And I actually think that's making our culture stronger mm -hmm. because people are coming together and saying, we are going to get through this shit together and we're going to start doing it. Now, to Colin's point, we still recognize wins, right? Now it's like, did you get cussed out? No. Good job. <laughs> right? <laughs> recognize the wins but the wins are separate than our culture i think that's really important to remember damn it I'm that's a really good point that's uh if i've ever heard it below that's step to fluff so all right you all asked a ton a ton of awesome questions before we we really wrap this up i have uh i have one question for the panel um and then we will if we have time um take that final that final question just a quick recap remember we're giving out gift cards. We want to hear from you. So make sure you're tagging a little post on LinkedIn with a little hashtag, state of sales, and tag an air call, tag in Zendesk Cell. Um, let us know what we did and shoot a picture of Colin's face. He, he likes pictures of himself. So make sure that you get that up there. And and please m write in those posts that, that we're doing this again tomorrow at five o'clock. And, yes. and you are all welcome to attend again. Come back. Come back. You didn't get your question answered. Come on back. We'll five o'clock Eastern yeah. time tomorrow. Uh, all right, so last question panel, and you all get to answer it. Let's go. So uh, it's this. It's my one of my favorite questions, okay? We have a mixture of talent in here, from rock star SDRs, rock star leadership, to people that have just entered the business. Podcast, book, place to start, place to go. Where should they spend their time? What, what should they go and read and know? You could start by following us all on LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah. right. we're super we're super cool so that's yeah, I, okay. well there's there's that the, the the more of this i drank the cooler i got uh you want to start us yeah sure um so a, a book that we all read as a sales team right now is uh good old never split the difference by chris voss um so i think a, a really popular one in the sales uh, community right now, but um, I, I really like his approach. Um, also, uh, Persuasion by Robert Cialdini is another one uh, to sort of balance that out as well. So um, sort of two really big, important books uh, to our sales team here. Um, yeah. Awesome. Ashley. Hi. Uh, great question. Thanks for not prepping me before. Uh, but uh, I would say Podcast, anything you follow, just Colin's content, like something like that. Yeah, for sure. So I guess for me, like one that I always go back to is Radical Candor. Uh, uh, I'm a really big believer on building relationships with your people. Um, I think regardless of times like we're in right now with um, fuck the shit storm that we're in. I think what's most important is like build with your people because when it comes down to times like this, like you have to have the trust that like is reciprocal. And so whether that is as small as like what your day to day looks like, what your business is like micro macro, whatever it is. Um, I really loved that book. And I like to think that that's how I built my relationships with my managers and my, and my um, SDRs that report to me. 
they could be commenting right now saying I'm high out of my mind, but no, I really, really think that um, relationships are first foundational to uh, what's going to come, especially in times like this is what's going to help your org and your entire team get through all those times. And so to me, that's my favorite book, read it, love it. Awesome. KD. Yeah, I mean, I think they were giving me some shit before y'all jumped on because of like all like these books and this is like a minuscule amount of like the books that I have here. I think reading is massively underrated. I do. Like why take 20 years to learn something if you can learn from someone who did it for 20 years in a weekend? Like read, take your career seriously. I don't understand why, like, that's, I think my, my, like, we're all salespeople, so I can talk shit about salespeople. Like, I think that's what's so frustrating about salespeople is no other industry, high paying industry, doesn't force their people to read over and over and over again. I, I couldn't go be a nurse tomorrow. I'd have to spend six years in school, right? I couldn't go be a doctor, a lawyer, like none of that. Like, this is, this is nothing. You should be reading every single day. and But here's the key, and Colin touched on this. Read to apply. Don't read to read. I know people that read just to say how many books they read. <laughs> oh, I read a book a week. Have you done shit? No. <laughs> read this, y'all. Like, I'm telling you, like, read, take notes, and apply it. If you want a book list, like, hit me up, whatever. I can tell you what books apply to your current situation. Like, but just start reading you guys. Like you really should. It's underrated. It costs nothing. Just go do it. Uh, Kevin, someone asked in the audience, what are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? So I'm finishing up flip the script from Oren Clef. I'm finishing boundless by Ben Greenfield. It's like a personal um, wellness book. I just finished the leadership playbook by Jocko. So like I saw extreme ownership show up here. The leadership playbook is really strong. And then the seven practices of a mindful leader. Nice. So I tend to rotate through about three to four books at a time. I threw a few in the chat. Uh, the Surf and Sales podcast has been awesome. It's new. Uh, Scott Lease and Richard Harris are doing that. I think I'm on one this week. That wasn't a plug. I just remembered that I'm on it. Um, what else? Hey, hey, salespeople. I swear that wasn't a plug. I actually just remember. <laughs> uh, hey, salespeople podcast from Jeremy Donovan is awesome. It's a sales loft podcast. Jeremy Donovan is incredible. Uh, what else did I throw out there? Rob Jepson, the sales leadership podcast uh, from Rob Jepson. I, I really like that one. Those are always really good. And then Extreme Ownership. If you haven't read it yet, you absolutely have to, uh, especially during these times where you are... Uh, managing yourself right uh probably more than you ever have before for those of you for for all of us really um yeah i uh so i i absolutely love stream ownership dove into that book lived it i honestly think if you're not taking ownership over everything you do then you know you should probably go read that book and everyone should read that book if you haven't read it the other books that i've read uh that i really love and applied uh to my daily work one of them was the miracle morning um by hal elrod hal elrod yeah Great book, really great book. Um, I mean, for a while there, I, I was able to really like redefine my life before 8 a.m. And it was a it was a really it had a lot of impact on me. So there there was that one. I also love to read stories about people that are like at the top of their game um, and like have done really incredible things because it, it helps me think about or get into the mind of people that push themselves beyond beyond normal limits. And so uh, a couple of those books, one of them is Call Sign Chaos by General Mattis. You should totally check that out if you're a leader. That's a really cool book. Um, it's got a lot of interesting points in there. One of my favorite points is that he talks about how in the Marine Corps, um, how every single rank has a book list. And what's cool about being a leader in the Marine Corps is that you know, based upon the rank of your people, what books they've read so you can relate to them. If there's ever been a goal of mine that I have to go and do is to go build the book list for the different people in my orgs. I think that would be so cool to be able to re recreate that. I love that. Um, the other one is uh, Sea Stories uh, 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 by uh, Admiral uh, McRaven. Um, that is a Navy SEAL that's done incredible things, served multiple presidents, has had an just 
unreal career. And he's the one that, that wrote Make Your Bed. Um, this guy has I was just such a that. way of talking about his career. Yeah, he taught such a way of talking about his career that makes you just want to elevate your game. So love that. Um, if you want to cool. have a good day, uh, Ashley, you start by making your bed. Um, so I think there's one other thing here too. So like I, 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 um, I we are we are a little over time. That being said, if you have to jump off, you should feel free to go and do so. I want to ask the panel, guys, do you have like an extra 10 minutes? Maybe we can take a question or two from the audience from everything we just went over. Are you guys open to extend just a couple minutes here? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I yep. think so. I, I'm going to put it in the chat. Like, I'm down to hop on a Zoom after this as well. I know it's late on the East Coast out there, but I'll put my Zoom in the um, the Slack here. I'll keep this shit going. I still got bourbon to finish. Like, I'm, I'm down to keep it, keep it rocking. So a couple things at the top, guys. You'll notice it says 27 minutes. In 27 minutes, this whole thing just kills, okay? Like, you really like it or not. Um, so I'll say goodbye now and say thank you so much for joining us and being a part of this. If you didn't get your questions answered and you have to you have to leave us, come join us again tomorrow because we're going to do it again, and it's going to be a great time again. That being said, I'm going to live this out. Let's get some questions. Kira, let's drum them up. Um, there was one that came up earlier. Uh, which is interesting. It said, um, hey, to, to KD, and maybe we can talk about this to just general. What's the best way to retain what you read and apply it? Mm. Apply it right after you read it. So Colin and I were chatting about this. You don't, don't read a book cover to cover. Like you get to something that you want to apply, mm -hmm. go apply it, right? But another big part is take really good notes. So like when I read yeah. a I read, I take notes, I take notes, but also this is a big part. Take notes on how you'll apply it. Highlighting is shit. That doesn't do anything. When you see something that stands out to you, write how you think you'll apply it. That way, when you go through your notes, you see how you thought you'd do it and you can pick and choose what you're going to do. Yeah, that's a great point. When, I, when I'm reading stuff, I'm, I'm constantly, I do a lot of audiobooks because my eyes just start to hurt. And so I'm pausing it all the time to like transcribe into my phone uh, that idea. And then I'll, I listen back to it. Like I love those nuggets and it's, I, I don't think I've ever made it cover to cover in any sales book because I just stop so many times to soak up those nuggets and, and, you know, like, I, and maybe months later I go back to the book and, and, and start to finish it. And like, I'm hopping around them, but, uh, I'm at any given time, like in the middle of like five different books and I never finish them. And like, I still get a shit ton of value from it. Yeah, I think another. Go ahead, Michael. I was just gonna say, like, we. I, I just went the, through this with the team. Um, I cited never split the difference a second ago. One of the ways that we sort of tackled this issue is we practiced the one topic over and over again until we all got really good at it. So I'll give a specific example. Um, is like getting to know and never split the difference. And people kind of struggled with it the first time through, the second time through, but through practicing the concept over and over um, and sort of that that collect, collective reading of the book as well. I had, I had one rep come up to me and say, hey, I read that book on my own, but for some reason I didn't understand that concept, but like reading it together was, was really helpful. Um, so I think like practicing the concept over and over you learn as well is really important. Yep. Repetition is the key to repetitive success. Did you, did I like that. that? KD had quotes all day. I, I just came up with that, I think. <laughs> Maybe someone said it before. I wrote it down. You made me think of it. I had to try to be a little bit cool. Is like there KD. a fortune cookie company on here? Someone write some of this stuff no. down and get it going. Uh, Honestly, I, th I think it's just like the rest of us that are still on here. But um, I did want to bring up the fact that, well, I love you boys for sure. And I respect you all. And I followed actually a lot of your careers for a while. Like, this is not the first conversation that we're having where we are meeting and having this. I was a little bummed that we didn't have any females that were a part of this. And I want to challenge you all to help get some more women in this uh, mix. Whether, mm -hmm. I mean, it's something I was challenged. So building on an org um, in Salt Lake uh, was really tough. And we did it, but now yeah. given with COVID, like it's become even more difficult, but now I want to figure out how do we continue to do this kind of stuff in a virtual environment, which hasn't been a challenge we've had to be faced with quite yet. And 
whether you want to call it female, male, B and I, whatever, like, I just think it should be something that we focus on. Are you talking more about getting more women into sales or into these events or both? Um, both, but I think yeah. the events are where yeah. it starts, right? The events are, is where like the just face of it happens. Um, I've yeah. spoken at a handful of female based like conferences across the board, but that still doesn't even seem to like be what moves the needle. Like how yeah. do we get people into these conversations? How do we have them like be a part of these like smaller dialogues that then infiltrate up into like the larger piece of what the panels look like? Ashley, 100%, there's yeah. no excuse behind it that w why there wouldn't be more. I do know that we had a few other people that were slated to be able to join us for this, but unfortunately weren't yeah. able to. But, but, uh, but nice. 100%, it is absolutely top of mind and and uh, should be talked to the end of, of time. So awesome. And I appreciate you bringing that up. I do. And I don't, I thank you. And I don't mean it as no. a criticism or anything as far as like, why haven't, why hasn't it happened? I know why, like I'm there, I'm on the front lines. I get it. Like we just have to do better and that's it. Yeah. That's it. Like you guys, like, trust me, I wouldn't be on this panel tonight if I didn't feel like you guys weren't on the same page of all that. Like it's not a, you know. No, and it's important too. There's 61 yeah. other people on this line that that like need to hear that message as well. And they're all gonna hold events as well. So that's a really important message just to get out and across. So I, I appreciate yeah. it. Uh, you guys always crush it. I love it. You guys always are like leading on the forefront of diversity and just all around of helping it across the board. So I appreciate you guys so much. And that's why I wanted to join it. So. No, I love it. We I appreciate it. you. Um, uh, let's see. Hold on, backstage. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay. Uh, let's see. How about one final thought from each of us as a strong way to wrap up this whole piece? Katie, you want to kick it off? One thought. Um, I'll, I'll put it this way. Take your careers seriously as a leader, as a rep, as a person, like really invest in your career. Most people put 10 times as much effort into their high school sport as they do their career. And that's it's just something that's not, all right, take pride in being a salesperson. Like I know we get shit on, I know we get yelled at, I know we get rejected, but take pride in what we do. But the only way you can take pride in it is being good at what you do and being really good at what you do. And it takes practice, it takes time, it takes reading, it takes events like this, it takes mentors, but take your career seriously, y'all. Like, we're blessed to be in sales. I know it's hard, but we're blessed. No other, no other position out there pays what this pays, with the freedoms that this allows, with the flexibility that provides. Like, take pride in this, but take your career seriously. I think that would be my number one, um, I guess, parting thought. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, in, in the current like environment that we're in, my sort of first gut che check reaction was it's hard to be like stressed out and feeling uncertain and sad and all the mixed emotions that we've collectively all had over the past month in the same breath and mindset of uh, learning, learning and connectedness to like one another, like it, it and so I, I just really like am encouraging, like even through those tough moments to view everything um, as a learning opportunity. And, you know, the people that are doubling down on, on learning and, and, you know, like Katie said, like events like this and, you know, keep, keep trudging forward and following leaders who are also doing those things as well through leading through example. And, and that's not only how you win today, but that's how you win when, you know, a time does get better and, and, and you meet that moment with opportunity as well. So definitely double down on, on learning right now. Yep. Want me to jump in? Yeah, Colin. Yeah, I think especially during this time, it's really important to remember that you should take advantage of every bad moment, right? Every time that something really bad happens in your life or in your career, uh, it's an opportunity to turn it into something great. And it's easier said than done. But if you look at this moment and all the complexities that come with it as a setback, you're thinking about it the wrong way. 
the setback is temporary and what you make of it is long term right and so if you're getting laid off if you're missing your quota if any of those things are happening to you those are short term effects right and what you take from that and the direction you go can always be a level up it always can i've never seen a great person you can quote me on this this might be a good quote for the books i've never seen i've never seen a great person get fired and not move on to something better than that job was for them before. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever seen it. I can't think of a time. I've never seen a great person get fired and not move on to something better. And a lot of times it's a it's a blessing in disguise and I'm being morbid here talking about firing and stuff, but I know it's everyone's scared shitless, right? Any of us could not have a job tomorrow. That's the, the reality. And it could happen today or even in normal environment, but um, if you're great at what you do, sometimes you get comfortable, right? And sometimes it takes that kick in the ass to push you to to move to the next thing. And so seize the moment, look at every downfall uh, as a chance to step up, and uh, you'll 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 come out uh, on on a better end. Um, look, like we're we're going to have down moments, okay? It's it's going to happen. Um, I mean, my, like my thoughts are the same. Like I totally agree. Um, I think in these times you have to focus on everything that you can control individually. And I think, um, that we are always faced with adversity, always, regardless of what the time frame is, whether it is what we're going through right now or any other time. But what can you do individually to keep yourself positive? And like, I think even like take work out of the equation, take what we do day in, day out and throw it out, right? Like that shit sucks. We deal with quite a bit of no's and negativity. What can we focus on when it comes to like, how can we better ourselves to position ourselves when it comes to like, actually reaching out to prospects and things like how can you have a mentally sound brain like are you happy are you positive are you positioning yourself in a spot in your frame of your world to be happy and i think there's so much that can happen that we um kind of take for granted and so i think you can get back to basics like you were saying earlier brian like how do you do that at the rep level and how do you do it at the team level you'll be able to continue to grow from there. I love it. Yeah. Look, like, look, like we're we're going to have down moments. This is not going to be the only time where we're faced with adversity in sales to Ashley's point to everyone else's point. This is going to happen again, right? I promise it's cyclical. This happens, but it's about how you respond to it. I think that's what everyone's saying here, right? Invest in yourself. Colin's going to laugh because he knows that I talk about inputs and outputs. All right. It's like my favorite thing to talk about, but your brain is what you put into it. So if you put good inputs in here, good outputs come out of it. And that means good thoughts, that means positivity, that means positive reading, that means positive everything, right? Invest in yourself first. You are a personal brand, okay? I happen to have a contract with aircall.com, but I work for brianalcester.com. That's who I work for. I take care of myself. It's aircall.io. Right, all right, yes, right, don't go to (laughs) aircall.io. Don't do that. Go to aircall.io. But that being said, shut up, Colin. That being said, right? Okay. I happen to have that contract, but at the same point, all right, I, I'm taking care of I'm taking care of me. I, I'm taking care of my family. I'm taking care of my my health. I'm taking care of like the things that matter to make me function so that when I do other things, it all resonates into the universe in the most positive of ways. And you all did something tonight that was really unique. You invested in yourself for several several hours with a bunch of people that had th- something to say. I got news for you. That in and of itself tells you that you're in the right place. You're setting down your, yourself down a good path. So invest in yourself. Take care of yourself. And no matter what happens, don't let times like this get in your way. You're going to get through them. We all will. Guys. That, my friends, is State of Sales for the West Coast. You guys have rocked it. A big thank you to Michael and Kevin and Colin and Ashley. Thank Thank you you. so much for coming and doing this. You guys rocked it. Thank you, Zendesk Cell.
for, for helping sponsor this and aircall.io. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Let's have a really great night and we'll see you tomorrow. Come join. Peace. Better y'all. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.